strong and amazing legacy of worship leadership and musical gifting that I am privileged to now lead. Even with the many God moments and opportunities that have defined this thriving ministry over the past decades, we believe that the best days are ahead for all of us here at Brentwood. God is at work and I'm inviting you to join us. The choir and orchestra kick off the fall season on August the 9th at 6 p.m. in the choir and orchestra rehearsal rooms located right behind the worship center. No auditions are required for either choir or orchestra, just a heart for worship and a calling to serve this church by being a leader on the platform on Sunday mornings and special occasions such as our annual Christmas presentation. For those interested in choir, just show up. You don't have to be able to read music. You'll learn everything you need to know. We'll take good care of you and show you exactly where to go and what to do. For those of you that are interested in orchestra, we'd like to prepare for your arrival. Please let us know that you're coming by emailing Mike Lawrence. We're going to have an exciting fall, and I hope that you will come see what's happening in the worship ministry at Brentwood. Well, good morning, church family. It is so good to be with you today to get to gather as the body of Christ. Just want to take a moment to say welcome if you're here every Sunday or if this is your first time with us this morning. We pray that it's a meaningful experience for you. Uh, and if you would, there's a communication card in the pew in front of you. Fill that out. Use that to let us know how we can better be serving you, how we can better be praying for you this week. Also, uh, at the end of our service this morning, our pastor is going to give everyone a chance to respond to what we've heard today. And if you sense and you feel the Holy Spirit moving and working in your heart this morning, I want to encourage you. Go talk to one of our counselors. Go talk to one of our ministers, the area called Next Steps, just out these doors to the right. They want nothing more than to love you, to encourage you, and to pray with you. It's a great day to be in God's house, a great day to sing the praises of our God. We've asked one of our members, Vicki Dvorak, if she would open our service in the, in the scripture. Vicki, will you lead us? From Psalm 59, the Psalm of David. But I will sing of your strength and will joyfully proclaim your faithful love in the morning. For you have been a stronghold for me, a refuge in my day of trouble. To you, my strength, I sing praises because God is my stronghold, my faithful God. Jehoshaphat aims to conquer Moab with a choir. God had said the battle is mine to fight. And Jehoshaphat says, well, let's put the choir at the front. Verse 21. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy array as they went before the army. And say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. In other words, shout to victory before the battle commences. Because God had promised it. I think the writer of this book wants us to learn from verse 22. Even though victory belongs to God, the singing of the choir is the occasion for the victory. Singing is not merely a response to grace. Singing is a means of grace. Singing is power. When you sing, the Holy Spirit comes and does something. Jehoshaphat sang with the choir, and Moab and Ammon and Seir killed themselves. And when Paul and Silas sang, it says, God shook. Surely the lesson is there is power when the people of God sing. There are two weapons that we have to fight Satan with in worship. The word of God and song. I beseech you, give heed to the word and sing with all your heart. There's power when the people of God sing the praises of our God. I invite you to stand this morning. I invite you to sing with all your heart. Let's sing together. 
in Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought of storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving sees my comforter my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i'll stand in christ alone who took on flesh fullness of god in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross that jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ I Your breath 
Psalm 145, will you read it together? I will exalt you, my God the King. I'll praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. All the earth. In Chicago, 1871, Horatio Spafford was about to board a boat with his wife and his four kids. He got called away at the last minute for business, so he sent his family on ahead of him to meet up later in the week. Two days later, the ship carrying his, uh, his family collided with another boat, sank in 12 minutes. Two days later, he received a telegraph from his wife and it simply read, saved alone. So he boarded the next ship he could to meet his wife. And as he was sailing across the waters, there was four daughters that just died two days before. So he got a, a pencil and a piece of paper. He wrote these words. Ladies, we sing this together in peace like a river.
Return to your rest, my soul. For the Lord has been good to you. And the opportunity now to come before the author of our hope, the perfecter of our faith, the giver of perfect peace. Whatever is on your heart, you can bring that to him knowing that he loves you. Knowing that he is here with us, he offers you hope and he offers you peace even now. Our pastor will be kneeling down front. Come pray for him. Come pray over him as he prepares to bring God's word to us. However the Holy Spirit is leading you this morning, let's come together now in prayer. You can be seated. Let's pray together. you this morning with thankful hearts, with grateful hearts for all that you've done, all that you will do and continue to do. We lift our hearts to you this morning. We lift our pastor to you this morning. Speak your word to us. Soften our hearts so that we can hear from you, so that we can be more like you. God, it's in your holy name I pray. Well, good morning, church. Today we get the blessing of being a part of a baptism for brothers. Uh, so this morning we have Camden Jones, is 10. We have Jones Hall, excuse me, I got that wrong. This is Camden Hall, and this is Jones's brother Hall. Jones is seven, and uh, so got the opportunity about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, to talk with them uh, about their decision. And uh, both of them did it with their parents, Camden did it about three years ago with his mom and a couple months ago decided, you know, this is the time for me to tell people that uh, I know Jesus. And so Camden, I wanna ask you this morning, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing light instead of his death, raised to walk in a new life. <clears throat> And this is Jones Hall, who is seven years old, and just like his brother, uh, driving down the road with his mom, pulled into the park, uh, the driveway at their house, and in their garage, they sat in the car and they talked through what it meant to be a Christian. And in that moment, he asked Jesus Christ to be his Lord and Savior. And so he wanted to come this morning with his brother to be able to tell you all what God has done in his life. And so Jones, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Awesome. Well, it's my honor, my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bearing the last of his death, raised to walk in a new life. A lot of us have known that something needs to happen. Something needs to change. You watch the evening news and you say somebody should do something and we wait for the politicians to come up with some kind of answer. We wait for some kind of law to be passed. Then anyway, it hits us. If something's going to happen, it's going to happen through us, not only us as individuals, but us as the people of God. You know, I know there's an issue with racial reconciliation in our nation. And far too long we have sat back 
and we have waited for somebody else to deal with it, when it is becoming more and more evident, more and more clear, that God is calling the church, especially the church in North America, to address this issue that now divides our country. That's why we're so excited to be partnering with Mount Zion Baptist Church and my good friend Bishop Joseph Walker and the community outreach event August 5th. Now here's the good news. The good news is that our two churches have already paid for over 2,700 backpacks. Uh, they're paid for, they're packed, they're ready to go. Uh, all, uh, all of the volunteer positions have been filled. So yeah, that's pretty exciting. Now, if you didn't get in on the fun and didn't know, didn't get to volunteer, that's okay uh, this year. Uh, but don't let it be a habit. <laughs> uh, we want you to come. We want you to be part of the event. We want you to get to know some of the friends at Mount Zion uh, Baptist Church. We want the relationships uh, to begin to cross over uh, the things that now separate us. And, and let Nashville see what happens when God calls all of his children together in one place to serve the community. And how beautiful that is when people who know God in different ways come together to celebrate who they know him to be. The reason we celebrate diversity is because no one can hold the experience or the totality of God in one experience or in one life. It takes all of us to say that. And we knew we wanted to be part of that. We didn't know how it was going to work out. And uh, when I talked with Bishop Walker, he said, we do this thing in August. Do you think your church would want to be part of that? And so this is kind of the pilot project, the first step to help us get it started. Now, here's why this moment and that moment get connected. Sometimes when Jesus calls us to do something, he doesn't give us the details. Okay? He, he, I, I tell you all the time, he won't tell you the second thing till you do the first thing. Okay? And a lot of you want to, I want to know the second thing. And you don't know because you haven't done the first thing. We knew he was calling us. So we looked for relationships. We looked for those friendships. Bishop Walker and I got together, uh, found a way for our churches to get together. And we had the resources we need because of your faithfulness and your uh, generosity. We had the resources we need to respond when the opportunity came. That's why this moment is so important. Because sometimes we know God is calling us to do something, we just don't know what yet. And because of your faithfulness and your generosity, we have the resources we need when we need them, when God reveals to us the second step. So our ushers will be coming forward as we celebrate our giving uh, here in the, in the main sanctuary. If you're joining us in Hudson Hall, I mean uh, in um, Baskin Chapel and uh, the overflow, we welcome you and the ushers will be coming there to serve you as well. So let's continue our worship as we give together. Uh, Lord Jesus, receive the gifts of your children for we give them with great enthusiasm and excitement. Uh, confident of what you have done in our past, eager to see what you will yet do in our future. So take everything we are and everything we have so that there's not a man, not a woman, not a child who doesn't know the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. So we pray this in his name. Amen. Hi, I'm Joseph Walker, and I'm the senior pastor of the Mount Zion Baptist Church of Nashville, Tennessee. And Brentwood Baptist, thank you so much for partnering with Mount Zion for the 2017 Health and Baptist School Outreach Day at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday, August 5th at Hatley Park Community Center. Now, I have to tell you, your pastor and I are very dear friends. And one of the things that I do know is that when you want to get something done, you have to really find someone who's committed to it. There are a lot of people who talk about it, but your pastor has committed this great church to really moving the needle in terms of diversity in terms of sending a message to our community that we are really better together. So listen, Brentwood, we need you to come out because Mount Zion's coming out. I'll put it to you this way. Your pastor and I are really competitive. That's why I don't play him in checkers or chess. I don't even fool with him. He calls me when Golden State beats Cleveland and just wears me out. But I tell you what, it's on. Let's see. Let's see who's going to get this. Mount Zion, Brentwood, let's make this happen. Now, what he left out of that was he's good friends with LeBron James. And there was a couple of times in the, in the playoffs where he was literally sitting right behind LeBron. And I was watching the game and I saw him. 
<laughs> so I texted him. I said, what, you don't have any friends? You can't get any friends? LeBron couldn't get you another ticket? What? That is just... So uh, that was when I became a Golden State Warrior fan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just to wear him out. But, uh, I mean, if you don't follow him on Twitter or Instagram, you need to. Uh, he is, uh, he's, he, he's an energizer, energizer bunny on that thing, man. And so he's, uh, he's doing some incredible things, and it's, it's really, I'm learning a lot from him. So you plan to be there and celebrate what, uh, what God is doing when all of his children uh, get together to serve uh, the community. It was the early 60s, and a new phenomenon was hitting America, and it was called soul music. Now, soul music is what happened when gospel music, uh, blues, R&B moved into the city and got hit with some urbanization and some new beats, and all of a sudden, out of places like Detroit and the Motown sound, we had incredible artists like James Brown. I can't play that too long because some of you are going to get up and start dancing, right? Uh, we, we had Aretha Franklin, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Right? Did you know she didn't write that song? Marvin Gaye wrote it. She recorded it first. And when she recorded it, Marvin said, she stole my song. Now, anytime he sings it, everybody thinks he's singing Aretha's song. But it's his song. We had Marvin Gaye and Heard It Through the Grapevine. What's going on? We had Otis Redding and Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. The problem was, when you tried to tell somebody what soul was, we couldn't do it. We just knew if you had it or if you didn't. Okay? We could tell if some musician had it. And you would hear somebody, have you heard him? Yeah. Have you heard her? Yeah, boy. She has soul. He has soul. And then somebody else would play. Mm -mm -mm. What's missing? Don't know. Just don't have. In fact, Flats Waller, the, the great uh, uh, musician, he said, if you got to ask, you ain't got it. <laughs> the worst thing in the world would be for somebody to say to you, you had no soul. It meant you lacked authenticity, you lacked depth, you lacked richness. That, yeah, you were saying the words, you knew the lyrics, but you didn't know the music. Whatever you were saying, it, it was hollow, shallow. You had no soul. It was the ultimate insult. But you know, it wasn't a new one. Oh, the 60s and 70s is not the first time that somebody's been told they had no soul. In fact, it goes way back, way back, all the way back to the letter of James. When he told the early church, if you hear but don't do, you have no soul. James chapter 1, verse 22. Stand with me in honor of God's word. As we read James' explanation. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, that man is blessed. In all that he does, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Give us the courage to hear and the courage to do so that we'll be ones who know and will know because it has been verified, validated in what we have done. And we pray this in your name. Amen.
The early church and the time of, of James writing this letter was going through uh, a very, very difficult transition. Now remember, it's probably AD 50, uh, somewhere around in there, 50, 55, when James is, is writing this. Uh, he's in Jerusalem. Uh, the church is undergoing a famine. It's undergoing persecution. They have sent um, uh, missionaries off. Uh, the missionaries have come back. They've had the conference about what, what Gentiles have to do in order to become real Christians. And, and so they've had a couple of controversies. They're struggling. And now there are a couple of things are happening that James is trying to address. One, it's taking longer than they thought. Uh, there were many people in the New Testament uh, who seemed to give indication in their writings that they expected Jesus to come back within their own lifetime or very shortly uh, thereafter, that they did not anticipate a long gap between the time of Jesus' ascension, His return to the Father, and the time that He would return to His people. Now, what they thought was a sprint is now turning into a marathon. It's a different pacing. If a different way of living is a different way of expecting. Uh, some of them had given up that Jesus wasn't going to come back at all. And so those had to be re-encouraged and re-energized to get back in the race. Because just because Jesus had delayed did not mean he wasn't coming back. The second problem they were having was next generation leadership. Now remember, uh, mid 60s 65 or so, both Peter and Paul were executed under Nero. Uh, we think John was the only original apostle who lived to be in his 90s, who, who died of old age. Every other apostle died a martyr. So by this time, we're getting to a place where we are running out of those first generation leaders, uh, those people who were originally with Jesus, who originally saw Jesus. Um, and, and so we're writing letters back and forth to encourage the church, to encourage the next generation to step up and act on what you know to be true. What you have heard, now we want you to live out. What you know, we now want you to do. Now James had a hard time getting into the canon, and this is why. Because he never talks about faith. Uh, and people were afraid that if you read James, then you would think that salvation was something that you worked for. That if you did enough, then you would earn your salvation. Uh, and the church went back and forth. So, uh, you know, how, that's how we got the canon. Uh, the canon is that group of, of books that we call our Bible. Uh, and in 90 AD, the rabbis closed the Old Testament canon and the vote mainly in response to all the New Testament writings. Several hundred years later, the church came up with the New Testament canon. And what happened was the pastors were writing each other. And they would say, when we read these books, when we teach from these books, there is something different about these books. We know Jesus in a different way. Jesus is revealed to us in a different way. And people started ascribing inspiration. We find these books to be uniquely inspired. And that's how we ended up with the books that make up the New Testament. Uh, we think there was a group of letters that somebody had pulled together. Um, a, a bishop named Onesimus had pulled together a lot of uh, Paul's letters that were circulated among the churches. The Gospels were circulated among the churches. And some other books were circulated among the churches. You know, about every Easter there's a new book that says, hey, we found some the lost Gospels, the Gospels that the church has been trying to hide. No, you didn't. We've known about the Gospel of Thomas. We've known about the Gospel of Peter. We read them. We didn't find them to be helpful. We didn't find them to be inspired. We, we saw things in them that didn't agree with the other texts, so we didn't put them in the canon. We did not lose them. We threw them away. If we had known you'd be digging in the garbage, we would have pressed it down further. Okay, so every time you see this, oh, there's something new, there's something lost. No, it's not. We didn't lose it, we threw it away. Didn't find it helpful in the reading. James made it. Now, Martin Luther didn't think it ought to be in there. Uh, 
because it, it emphasizes works. Now understand, I can always tell uh, which one of you have been reading the book of James, the letter of James, because you have a bloody nose. And if you tell me you're reading James and your nose isn't bleeding, I'm going to look at you and say, no, you're not reading James. James was not written with a pen. It was written with a two by four. Okay? And if you read James, it's stuff like no one can follow Christ if he doesn't take care of his tongue. Pow! Do that. You can't control what you say because a, a ship is a big boat, a rudder is a little piece of wood, but it is the rudder that steers the ship. The tongue then steers the life. And so that you'll read about two verses of James and your nose will be sore and your eyes swelling up because he's pow, pow, take that one. I got another waiting for you in the next verse. So come on back. Now James is hard to read because he takes no prisoners. So here he is in the first chapter. I mean, he hasn't even warmed up good. And here's what he says. Don't be hearers of the word, but doers of it. Now, I'm sure... Uh, the church he was writing to was nothing like any of the churches that I have pastored, where people will study a lot about Jesus, be really smart when you play Jesus Jeopardy, but have no clue how to live it. Never show any evidence of a life being changed. But think if I know a lot about Jesus, it's the same as knowing Jesus. And it's not. This is what James is challenging. Now, there are a lot of people who say, well, if I believe, the Corinthians had this problem, if I really believe and really sincere in what I believe, then it doesn't matter what I do. James says, uh-uh. It's what you do that tells me what you believe. And if you don't live it, you don't believe it. If you don't live it, you don't believe it. Now, what he tells the early church is Christianity is a lot like the science classes we all took. You would go to lecture where we would be given the information. Your professor would say, if you mix this, chemistry, this chemical with this chemical, things blow up. Then that afternoon you'd go to lab where you would mix those two chemicals and you get to blow up stuff. It was wonderful. But there was always the two things, the learning and then the doing. The doing validated the learning. The doing validated the knowing. The knowing informed the doing. You have this cycle of knowing and doing that feeds the other. The reason some of you doubt is that you have never had the courage to validate, verify the teachings of Christ in the doing. So you hear Jesus teach and you listen and you say that won't work. Okay? Now, when I was a little kid sitting in church way too much, I would hear these really polite teachers say, Jesus says, turn the other cheek, Mike. I was thinking, so somebody hits me, I turn the other cheek, they hit that cheek, then do I hit them? <laughs> I've got to give somebody two punches before I hit back? But you hear Jesus say that, what do you think? Same thing I thought, this won't work. If I do this, Jesus, in the way I operate my business, if I do this, Jesus, in the way I hang out with friends, they will perceive me as weak, and it will be blood in the water to sharks, and I won't survive. That is beautiful, Jesus. I'm going to cross-stitch it and put it on my refrigerator, but there's no way it'll work. Then you find yourself in a situation where somebody is mean to you. Somebody hurts you. And your first reaction is to hurt them back. Right? Fight fire with fire. No, you don't. You fight fire with water. I was a chaplain with the fire department. We never went out to a fire and said, hey, sit these two houses on fire. We'll put this house out. <laughs> you put water on it. 
You do not overcome evil with more evil. You do not defeat evil by being meaner than the people who are mean to you. You overcome evil with grace and mercy. You overcome hatefulness with love. So I find myself in a situation where somebody is hateful, mean, hurts me, and my first reaction is to defend myself. And I find myself praying, and my prayer is this, I don't believe this will work, but I will do it because it is what you teach. But honestly, if it doesn't work, I'm going to hit him. <laughs> and then you try it. You don't fight back. You don't defend yourself. You seek the best for the person who is angry. And lo and behold, now the guy who was once an enemy is now a friend. It worked. What I heard, what I was taught, has now been verified and validated in the doing. Now, you can't just work all the time, do all the time, because if you don't know what you're doing, oh, we've been there before, right? You read your scripture, you know, you hear, you go do, it's validated, you come back and you learn more. Do you notice how Jesus worked with the disciples? He would teach, then he would send them out. They would come back, report to Jesus, he would teach, then he would send them out. There's always the knowing and the doing. Here's what we're working on today, now go do it. Okay, once you learn, come back, we'll talk about it some more. That's the way it happens. If you don't do that, then you're like a man who can't see himself in a mirror. Does that ring any bells with you? I'm an old movie buff. Who is it that can't see himself in a mirror? Oh, do I have to teach you everything? I have to go back. Dracula. Dracula can't see himself in a mirror. So the whole movie is all these people running around with mirrors trying to catch Dracula because that's the way you prove he's a vampire is a vampire can't see themselves in a movie, in a mirror. The original living dead. Dracula can't see himself in a mirror because he has no soul. So James writes, if you hear the word and don't do it, you have no soul. If you hear the word and don't do it, you're a zombie. You ever wonder why we've got so many zombie movies out? Because that's the way most of us live. Living dead. Can't see ourselves in the mirror because we know what we don't do. All right, I've got you all set up now. This is the part where I bring the hammer, right? You got there and get, get, get there and go do more. You got to work harder. But folks, it's not strength that we lack. It's not knowledge that we lack. You know what's missing in between the knowing and the doing? You know why that never gets translated over? Because what's missing there is love. Now, how many husbands have I talked to? And they would tell me, yeah, I know what to do. They just never do it. The marriage is harmed. Sometimes the marriage is lost because what they know, they did not love her enough to do it. Jesus said, if you love me, go to church more, sing louder. No. If you love me, keep my commandments. Here's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. If I have the gift of prophecy, 
I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. If I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. Why is it that we lack this love? Honestly, we leak. And we leak badly. What was once in us is now all gone. What we once knew, we forget. Fortunately, Jesus knew this about us. And he said, when you get together, I want you to come around a table, and I want you to share the bread, and I want you to share the cup. And when you do, I want you to remember. So we invite you now to the table of the Lord. The deacons will now be taking their places to serve you. As they prepare, use these moments to prepare your own life for the receiving of the cup and the bread. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, welcome us now to your table. Let us now... Join together with our brothers and sisters. Receive the bread. Receive the cup. Remember and be filled again. And we pray this in your name.
Don't you love that commercial with that guy with that super tape that can fix leaks? <laughs> so he shows a bucket of water, looks like somebody shot a hole in it, just walks over and swap. Fixes a leak in your pool. He's so confident in it that he saws a boat in half, tapes it all up, goes out across the river. When you watch that commercial, do you ever wonder who fixes the leaks in you? Where you can go to buy some tape. To stop the leak when somebody did that awful thing, said that awful thing, that cut your soul like a stiletto. You haven't stopped bleeding yet. Or that moment when you did something so cruel to somebody else that in your quiet moments you wonder if you are still a human being at all. And you run out of you. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat all of it. It stops leaks. If the bread becomes part of our own life, it fills us from the inside out. We pray, O oh Christ, now that you fill our lives full of you, pressing through every nook, every corner, every crevice that where we are weak you will now be strong where we leak you will now bring healing and where we are empty you will now bring fullness we bless you and pray in the, your name amen
Christ forgives. Yes, it is good news that he heals. But how sad it would be if that was the end of the story. For we would be empty vessels, repaired, restored. We don't leak, just empty. You see, once it's spilt, you can't get it back in. You can't get the spilt water back out of the ground and put it back in your little jar. You can't get the milk back in the carton once it's spilt. And once you leak, you leak out you, yourself, you. How do you get you back into you? <laughs> You can't. You're just left empty. It is Christ now who fills you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink all of it. Lord Jesus, how grateful we are for your healing, for your sealing of our lives and your filling of our lives. And we pray now that we would be so full of you and your love that we would leave here to be doers and not just hearers with your head still bowed and your eyes closed. I'm not going to put you on the spot, embarrass you in any moment. I do want you thinking about your own life. For some of you, it's just been a hard week. One of the reasons we get together is that we understand that for some of us, this is a hard week. And we're here to pray for you. We're here to encourage you. Our counselors are waiting for you out next to our table. It says, next step, right outside the foyer. You. You'll see it. They would love to spend some time with you, to hear your story, to pray with you, to encourage you, to be your friend on this part of your journey. And honestly, it would be our privilege to be so. For some of you, it's time to be part of this church fellowship. We will welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let us get that process started. But for some of you, the only thing you know right now is how hollow you are. How empty. You're the person I was talking about, that you have no soul. Christ is here to seal your life with his mercy and fill your life with his goodness. And I know I'm saying a whole lot. Go find our counselors out next to the table says next step. Just say, I want to know more about what Mike was talking about. They'll pick up the conversation from there, I promise you. Do not leave this place still leaking. Lord Jesus, every life is now open before you, every heart. And we pray the choices we make now are exactly what you want. Cheers you go. See you next week.